Hey guys, welcome to Fika with Rice, a podcast about life hacks, inspirational life stories, routines, and keys to success. I'm Frederick Van Hoon, and let's get this Fika started. Welcome to episode one by Fika with Rice. In this episode, I meet the incredible Clinton Terry, aka the Blind Grappler. A blind wrestler is a 10-time New Zealand national champion who competes against sighted opponents. Let that sink in for a second. In this episode, we'll hear how Clinton has always fought against all odds and achieved a massive success in his craft. His persistent and disciplined approach to life and training has seen him succeed and inspire thousands of athletes and people around the world. This is his story. Let's go. All right. Hello, Clinton. Welcome to the show. You're our first guest and I'm really excited to have you here. I thought to kickstart this by asking you, how was your mother growing up? Can you tell us a little bit more about her? Uh, how was my mother growing up? <laughs> I was Before I start stories about my mother, I want everybody to understand that the way my mother brought me up now that I'm older or once I got older, I was extremely thankful for the way my mum raised me. But of course, when I was younger, um, you know, we clashed a bit because my mum was very strict on me. Uh, her philosophy uh, was I live in a sighted world and I have to adapt and fit in. It's not that sighted people need to work around me. I need to find ways to do things, right? So. Like I, I was super lucky because when I went blind, I was sick for a long time and I was in intensive care for 12 weeks and my mom had to watch me go through a whole heap of stuff. And she could have gone with two ways. The way that I see with a lot of people with disabilities um, where the parents have a lot of sympathy for them and they feel sorry for them and they try and make things as easy as possible for them. Or the way my mom did it where she was like, well, you're blind, get over it, <laughs> uh, basically was the attitude she had. So uh, my mom expected me, I, I'm the oldest uh, in my family, uh, with my brothers and sisters. And uh, when I went blind, I had one brother by then. And my mom just expected me to do everything for myself. Like the most basic example of this is, I know a lot of blind people that if they put their shoes somewhere, and they lose them. And then they went to their parents and said, oh, mom, I lost my shoes. They'd be like, oh, hold on a minute. I'll get them for you or whatever. My mom would be like, well, you should have put them somewhere that you knew where they were and remembered where you put them, shouldn't you? Go find them. <laughs> and she wouldn't help me, you know, like that's the sort of basic uh, example. And then, well, another story I tell <laughs> a lot of people, is my mom is a clean freak, like really, really like, you know, her house is always immaculate. And in the weekends, on a Saturday morning, we'd all wake up. She'd wake us up at like 7 o'clock in the morning, 7, 7.30 in the morning. And she'd give us a room each of the house. Uh, I have three brothers and a sister. And we'd all get given a room. And before we were allowed to go out and have the weekend to ourselves, we would have to clean the room, like, to perfection. We'd have to clean the walls. We'd have to dust the ornaments. We'd have to vacuum the floor or sweep it if we we're in a <laughs> house with wooden floors. We'd have to make sure everything was tidy and put away and everything. Like really like in depth job, right? Like not just a quick 10 minute clean. And her friends, when they found out that she'd make me do things like this, they'd be like, oh, you can't expect him to clean the walls or vacuum the floor. He's blind. He can't see where stuff is. And my mom was would be like, well, he'd better work out a pattern or a routine, of, a way of doing it, hadn't he? Because he's not going to leave the room until it's done because being blind is an excuse to not learn how to clean things or whatever. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I never had any... Um, I, I don't think there was a job my mom ever never expected me to do or at least give a go, uh, including outdoor work. Like uh, uh, I've been allowed to, and, and this is where I'm lucky because I, I enjoyed this sort of stuff. I've been allowed to use a chainsaw. I've used a chainsaw to cut wood. I've used axes to cut wood, like 
when we lived out on a farm at one stage, we had a fireplace to heat the house. And my mom would expect me to cut wood just like everybody else who got their turn at cutting wood. So, um, you know, if she just expected me to do everything that everybody else did. And sure, like she understood that we had to put some processes in place sometimes to make things work. But her attitude was we can always find a process to make things work. Um, when I was about, I can't remember, maybe 10 or 11 years old, one day my mom was cooking dinner or whatever. She serves up dinner and I'm at the table and, and I make a complaint about dinner. And she's like, oh, you think you can do it better? Fine. You from now on have to cook once a week. <laughs> so from a very young age, I had to cook once a week for a household of like five kids and two adults or so seven people once a week I'd have to cook. So and I did when I um got older, I didn't meet any blind people that their parents had already taught them how to cook, for example. Right. So I was so lucky that in some ways like my mom was super hard on me. If I'd walk along and drag my feet while I was walking and like sh shuffle my feet, she just come up behind me and slap my ears and be like, hey, pick up your feet, you know, you you're, you're Fine. there's no excuse to drag your feet like that you know so although she was super tough on me um she gave me the tools that i needed later on to uh, be able to do well at life like you know i uh, me and my wife met when we were very young in fact when uh, me and my wife got together my wife had been very uh looked after by her family and so i had to teach my wife how to cook for example <laughs> <laughs> which a lot of people can't believe, but it's uh, true. And um, so I was so lucky that when, when it came time to like move out and stuff, I already knew how to do everything. I didn't have to go to a special, uh, you know, there's a place in New Zealand where blind sort of late teens, early twenties, they go and they learn how to flat. Like they have to learn how to do the laundry, how to, do even things like how to do the dishes and stuff. And I already knew how to do all that. So I was super lucky, um, you know, that I, I have the, had the ability to look after myself. <laughs> wow. It sounds, uh, it sounds amazing. Your mom was, uh, is, or was an amazing woman. Uh, it seems Clinton. What did your yeah. mom teach you about discipline? Uh, my mom taught me that, you know, everything can be overcome with hard work. I mean, my mom, she's such an amazing person because not only was her first child a child with a disability, but then she had uh, five children and she was an only parent. Like most of the time she was a solo mom. So um, growing up, you know, it was me and and my brothers and sisters and my mom, and we didn't have a lot of money. And she, you know, she always had to make money, go that extra distance and like be able to clothe and feed us all and stuff as a solo parent. Uh, she had to work and, and look after us. So uh, watching her uh, sacrifice and, and work hard, you know, she showed me, I don't know that, well, discipline like that, it was uh, work hard. Actual discipline, like my mom was very inventive with punishments. Um, it's now illegal to smack your children in New Zealand. But um, when we were growing up, um, we never really got smacked. There was only two things uh, we got smacked for, and that was stealing or lying. If we got caught doing either of those things, it would be pretty serious. My mom would use a leather belt on us. Um, other than that, my mom wasn't a big believer in smacking as discipline, but she was very inventive. For example, we moved into a house that had been built on an old um, car wreckers yard, uh, you know, where they um, took old cars and disassembled them and whatever. <laughs> and this house had been built on the old yard, but of course, um, there was a lot of old metal, like nuts and bolts and stuff that would come out through the ground in the backyard. So she had this um, little bucket. It was like a three liter pail, like not huge, but not small either. And if we did something to annoy her, she'd <laughs> give us the bucket and she'd be like, right, go outside and fill up the bucket with bits of metal and like 
the small stones and stuff. Over two years, she made us um, clean up the backyard like that, and then she dug it all up and, and we planted it with grass and stuff. So you can imagine as a kid, you get given this bucket and you're not allowed to come back inside until it's full of like nuts and bolts and all these things that come out through the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, that's a way worse, but I'd much rather just get smacked, you know, uh, cry and it's over then have to do things like that. Um, another one uh, she did was she, we lived in a, a yard with a, a, a backyard that's probably about 20 meters long. And she went down to this river and she got these three big stones and she put them what up on an end of the yard. And if we were bad, we'd get told, like, oh, you've got to go out and move the rocks for 15 minutes. So what we'd have to do is carry a rock from one end of the yard to the other, put it down, and then, um, oh, oh, no, sorry. I just <laughs> knocked that mat. Oh, luckily, you're only going to use audio. Ah. <laughs> oh, nope. my gosh. that That's not quite what we wanted to have happen. Okay. okay. Oh my gosh, blind people, there you go. I knocked over my thing that my iPad was on. Anywho, here we go. So yeah, we, um, we'd have to move these rocks up and down the yard. And we'd literally move them from one end of the yard and then carry them back to the other end of the yard. Like just boring, like, you know, not fun. So you never wanted to be sentenced to go and carry the rocks because that was super boring. So my mom was very inventive with uh, ways that she <laughs> came up to, came up with uh, to discipline us for doing uh, bad things. So, you know, between being disciplined and then watching my mother be disciplined in her life, I think that helped me later on with uh, martial arts and being disciplined with my training and being able to get through the things that, you know, aren't, aren't the most fun parts of training and things like that. Oh, it sounds like your mom was... Uh was very strict with you and it seems that you learned a lot from that Clinton and um, how how has the the lessons that your mom taught you been passed on to your own children how are you raising your children with the lessons that you learned while growing up um how am I raising my children with the lessons I learned when I growing up I've tried to be inventive with punishments and stuff as well and um, try to teach them good discipline. And to, the thing of when we were growing up and when, and my kids is the challenges I think are much different. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, there wasn't the same, like kids now get into different sorts of trouble and it's also a lot harder to, monitor your children uh like for example if somebody rung my house and wanted to talk to me when i was a kid my mom would pick up the phone and you know she'd pretty much know who was calling and then you know you'd go to the phone and to start with the phone was uh stuck to the wall and then eventually you got to call the phone but you know there was usually one or two phones in the house so my mom if she thought that we were talking to somebody we shouldn't be talking to or whatever she'd just go pick up the other line you know and listen to who we were talking to um and, and so communication and the ability to be sneaky as a child was different like the sorts of trouble kids got into back then and the sort of things that kids get into now is completely different like um uh, you know now kids have cell phones and even even if a parent says oh i don't want you to have a cell phone i don't know what it's like where you live but in new zealand you can go to the supermarket and buy a 20 dollar cell phone and get a sim card they don't ask for id or anything so kids have ways of secretly communicating and stuff that can get them into way more trouble if they're not smart and and then of course there's the uh the internet facebook all of that sort of stuff so i think for me i i've taken rather than a try and rely on having to discipline my kids um like don't do that if you do it then i'm going to discipline you i've tried to take an educational approach of trying to explain to my kids why doing certain things isn't um isn't so smart like me and my brothers we'd go out and build things or 
or pull things apart or, you know, different things to what kids do now where, you know, now they on computer, they on the internet. So it's like, what are you looking at on the internet? What are you putting up on the internet? Because once you put something on the internet, it's there forever. Um, you know, my, my daughter is, um, she's 13 now. Uh, she also does jujitsu and stuff and she, she's a sponsored athlete. So she has an Instagram account. Um, I, you know, educating, like saying things to her, like, you know, if you put up pictures that you don't like later, they're going to be there forever. You can't un take it down. So, you know, like, um, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of girls on social media, it's unfortunate, you know, they, they take pictures of, I don't know, in crop tops or in bras or whatever. And, and just trying to educate my daughter and saying, um, you know, don't do that because it's not a great decision. And, and whatever, because at the end of the day, I can't really stop her doing something like that because uh, there's just so much technology out there in that, that if kids are going to do stupid stuff like that, they're probably going to do it. And then mixing that in with um, discipline, like obviously if they break the rules that I have for them, then um, trying to come up with inventive punishments like my mum did and things like that. But more, I, I believe in this day and age, it's... I think the disciplining of kids has to be done before they're five years old. If they don't have a healthy respect for consequences by the time they're five years old in this day and age, you have pretty much lost the ability to discipline them because they, you know, there's just too much access to technology. There's just too many ways to go around your parents and stuff nowadays. Okay. Interesting. It seems that you have like a system behind it, Kim. I mean, your children are, are, are doing sports as well, and your, your eldest daughter is doing jiu-jitsu. Um, why do you think it's important for children to do sports? Uh, I think in this day and age, especially with technology ruling the world, um, sports teaches kids uh, discipline and stuff like that. I mean, when I was young anyway, you know, we didn't, I mean, we had TV and stuff and we had like Sega Master System. Like we did have some gaming device or whatever, but we didn't have like technology with us all the time. So, you know, we were outside, we were doing things, we were um, keeping fit and keeping active and, and learning that winning and losing is okay because, uh, you know, you'd go out and you'd play games with your friends. You'd play games of rugby. You'd play games of soccer. You'd play games of cricket. You'd play fight. Like, play fighting was okay when I was a kid. It was kind of expected. And so kids were learning that you win and lose, that winning and losing is a part of life. And one of the things I'm really sad about in this day and age is that people really try to tell kids that – well, they say winning doesn't matter. Now, the problem with like things like that, like, and for example, in schools, um, or a really good example of this, uh, a kid came into training one day and I said, oh, yeah, what have you been doing today? And they're oh, we play T-ball. And I said, oh, did your team win? And they were like, oh, we're not allowed to keep count of the score. And I was like, what do you mean you're not allowed to keep count of the score? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, you're not allowed to keep count of the runs and stuff because it doesn't matter who wins. It's, it's so long as you gave it a go that matters. Um, and, you know, there's so much of that in, in schooling and stuff now. But the problem is with this whole it doesn't matter whether you win and winning or losing isn't the problem. It it's, uh, isn't the point. It's participating that's the point is that, Sure, by your sheltering kids in school, you can take that attitude. But the problem is, as soon as you leave school, everything is a competition. Whether it's you're wanting to rent a house, well, you go along, you have interviews with the landlords and whatever, and the landlord gives the house to who they think is going to be the best tenant for their building. You're competing for that. You're competing for jobs. You you know you want to get employed. You go along. You have a job interview. The person interviews you, and they choose who they think is going to be the best person for the job. You're competing for the job. Um, man, even love. You know, you go out. You see a girl that you like, and or, or boy, and and 
you know, you've got to try and impress that person and see whether they're interested in you or not. And there might be a whole heap of other people trying to do that as well. And then they're going to make a choice and then you're either going to win or lose in this situation. And the problem with Pete, with the attitude of winning doesn't matter at schools, what they should actually be teaching is that losing doesn't matter. Because what happens is kids now don't get taught how to deal with losing. Man, I tell my daughter all the time, losing is a part of jujitsu. You're going to lose matches. I'm going to lose matches. It's, it's going to happen. I'm okay if you lose. But the thing is, what are we going to do about it to try and make sure it doesn't happen next time, right? Mm -hmm. So nowadays, I think, I think it's why there's a lot more depression out there in the world because all these kids, they go through school, they're not allowed to compete in school, they get told, you know, you, you know, so long as you try, that's all that matters. Then they go out to the real world and they realize, oh, wait on a minute, the real, the real world is not actually like that. The whole world is a competition. <laughs> and, and then they don't realize that, you know, losing is okay as long as you learn some lessons from that and then you take those lessons, you make it better, you try again. I mean, if you lose again, that's also okay. As long as you take that. When I started competing in wrestling, I lost 40 matches in a row without scoring a single point. Now, if I hadn't have been taught that sometimes you lose and sometimes you win growing up, I would have quit very early into my wrestling career, I'd imagine. There's not too many people I know that could lose 40 fights without scoring a point and mm -hmm. still continue uh doing something but i was stubborn and i i knew that if i kept or well, i believe that if i kept training and finding a way i could find a way to get to where i wanted to go so i think uh you know the differences between the kids now and 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 that is that it's not so much that they're taught you know winning's not okay it's that they're taught losing is not okay and that if you lose, it's okay to lose so long as you um, better yourself from that. That's a very interesting statement, Clinton. So would you say then that if children are doing sports, they're better equipped for, for life? Yes, I would because, well, especially if they're play, doing something like a martial arts sport, because if you are in a jiu-jitsu match, a wrestling match, uh, anything that's one-on-one, -on -one, it doesn't matter whether people tell you that there's like, <laughs> oh, we're not going to keep score. It is very obvious who won at the end of that. So, you know, they get taught, um, okay, sometimes I'm going to lose. But if I go back to the gym or if I go back to training and I train hard and, and work, then next time I can win. Um, you know, and... and then you can start teaching them goal setting for how to achieve their goals, right? Like, oh, I lost, um, I lost a match. So you go to them and you say, okay, what do we need to do to win next time? Or what do you want the outcome to be? I want to win. Well, okay, that person was so much better than you that just saying I want to win is not enough. We need a strategy to make this happen. Um, for example, I had a young boy who was wrestling and he was the second best in the country. But he wanted to go to an international event. Now, the kid that was better than him was substantially better than him. So at every tournament, he'd get to the final and then he'd lose to this kid. And he'd lose all the time. And he came to me and he said, Clinton, I really don't want to lose at the national. This is the start of the year. I don't want to lose at nationals this year to Dylan because if I lose, I'm not going to make the team. I was like, okay, we've got to make a plan on this. I said to him, all right, so what usually happens? He's like, oh, man, he takes me down and I get pinned in the first round. I said to him, okay, all you have to do in the next match for us to consider this a victory is that you do not get pinned in the first round. No matter what else happens, if you make it through the first round without getting pinned, when you come off the mat, we're going to celebrate this like you won the match. And um, he made it through the first round. Like the kid scored a lot of points on him and everything. And he made it through the first round and then he lost in the second round. And when he came off the mat, I was like, yeah, like celebrating, like, you know, and, and exactly like I told him, I said, we're going to celebrate it. And I made him celebrate it like we won because we'd achieved the goal. So we went back to training. I said, okay, you've proven that you can get out of the first round. So now the next match, we're going to score a point in the first round. 
And we're not going to care. If we score a point in the first round, just one point, and we get out of the round without getting pinned, we're going to celebrate it like we want. So he goes to the tournament and, you know, he, he'd obviously worked on a strategy. He gets his point. He gets through the round. He comes off. We celebrate it. You know, the next, the next match I said to him, okay, now we've got to make it to the end of the match. He's not allowed to pin you. So uh, you've got to score points and you've got to make it to the end of the match and we win. And he did that. And then I said, look, you can score points. You can make it to the end of the match without him beating you. You now know, basically, you have the ability to win now. Because now all you've got to do is score more points than him and not let him score. We got to the Nationals and he beat the kid and ended up on New Zealand team. So by setting small goals and celebrating those small goals and by him realizing that losing gave him um, more information to uh, keep improving, keep improving, we took him from losing against his kid. And it, like I say, he asked me about it at the beginning of the year and the wrestling season's about seven months. So within seven months from this kid absolutely thrashing him to him winning. And I mean, it was a win, like he just pulled it off. Like, maybe by one point by the end of the match or whatever but you know we took it from being smashed to him winning that's a that's a great story about the art of improvement and just keep being one person better than yesterday clinton and yeah exactly uh, i love how you draw a parallel to life how that it's applicable to when you're finding your own first apartment or your first house i mean you're basically competing for anything and even love. I mean, you're completely right about that, Clinton. And I mean, you're competing for your jobs, and and really interesting to hear that you're drawing a parallel to sports. Well, the problem. Well, well, the problem is because here also in New Zealand, you've got there's a little bit of tall poppy syndrome where if someone says I want to be the best at something, they kind of get shut down a little bit. An example: um, my daughter, two years ago, she hadn't won a national title yet. And she said, I really want to win a national title this year. And I said to her, well, awesome, sweet. And let, let's work for it and train for it. And, and so, you know, she started saying to everybody, I want to win this nationals. I want to win. She'd already been competing for um, three years, two and a half years. Um, and she, she's like, you know, I, I want to win so badly this year. I want to win the national title. And she started saying to people, I want to win the national title. And people would say to her, oh, um, no, but it doesn't matter if you don't win it, Aurora. So long as you go out there and you give it your best forever, um, you know, that's what matters. And I I ended up starting telling people, hey, excuse me, don't say that to her. And they're like, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, look, if her goal is to win the national title, let her have that goal and own it. As her parent, I understand that if she doesn't win the national title, it's not going to be the end of the world. But to her, if she wants to win that and be the best, she should be allowed to have that as a goal and be able to work towards that without people saying, oh, no, that, that goal isn't an important goal. Um, so long as you give it a go, that's all that matters. Because, you know, that, what, what if she says then, you know, she goes to school and she goes, I want to be, I, I want to get straight A's at school this year. Everything I do, I want to get straight A's. And everybody's like, oh, you know what, Aurora, straight A's doesn't matter. So long as you go to school and do your best, well, actually, the better your grades are at school, the better it is for you. So, you know, why are we telling kids if they want to aim high and, and achieve big things? Why are we going out and telling them that, you know, achieving big things doesn't matter so long as we give it a go? Now, hey, they may, they may not ever achieve these things. Like I've had kids tell me they want to be national champions and, and it hasn't ended up happening for different reasons. They haven't worked hard enough for it. There's just another kid who works a little bit harder or they're a little bit more talented. And and that's, you know, that's going to happen. Like, not everybody's going to be like, I have a huge goal and uh, I'm going to achieve it. And so, you know, they're going to achieve it. But everybody should be allowed that big goal and to be allowed to give a hundred percent effort to achieve whatever their huge goal is. And then of course, if they don't reach it, then that is okay that you didn't reach your huge goal. Like, I don't know, change your goal or I don't know, change what you're doing, whatever. I mean, if you want to keep 
man, for me, it took me, I started competing wrestling in 2000. It took me eight years to win a national title. Uh, you know, I could have stopped my goal a lot sooner than that, but I didn't. Uh, but it, it's okay to not reach your goals. Uh, that that doesn't make you a terrible person or a, a less worthwhile person. Um, you know, but I think people should be allowed to say, I want to be the best and do the best. Just because you say you want to be the best, that doesn't mean, you know, there's a difference between saying I want to be the best and then <laughs> being an asshole about it, you know, like being Eric, like I, I'm better than you, so you should, and, and like talking down to people or treating them differently. Yes. I'm not saying people should do that, but they should definitely be allowed to be, say, I want to be a national champion and I'm going to do everything I can to do that. <laughs> and, and they shouldn't have people saying, no, no, that, that goal doesn't matter. I completely agree with that, Clinton. I think uh, as long as you're doing it on humble level, you know, that, all right, I have these big goals and I'm going to work really hard to get there and I'm going to do my best to improve 1% every day, getting closer to the goal. I think that's uh, that's something that should be more ingrained in today's society. Where does this drive come from? You know, where do you think that came from, from you? Because it seems that you have that drive. You want to pass that on to to your children. Uh, where did that seed get planted? Probably, to be honest, my grandfather, uh, he, <laughs> oh man, my grandfather, Mr. Peter Terry, is the most stubborn human being I've ever met. And he was, so, or well, was with work. Um, unfortunately, he's very sick now and he's, uh, you know, he's elderly, he's got cancer and stuff. So, um, he's probably going to pass maybe within this year, but he, <laughs> man, I, he, he's a fisherman, a commercial fisherman. And every day he would get up and go to work. It didn't matter whether he was sick, whether, it, whether he was injured, whether he, no matter what, he got up and he went to work every day. And even when he started getting older and people tried to, um, you know, they tried to be like, oh, you're too old. You should retire. He he didn't retire. He he just kept going. And, and he, like, just instilled in me that, you know, if, if anything's worth having in life, it's worth, worth working hard for. And, and, like, he went through some crazy things. Like, um, one day when he was on the boat, he was um, gutting fish and stuff uh, and putting them in the uh, fish bin in the and he slipped over with a knife and cut his uh, neck and was like bleeding really badly. So they had to uh, like put pressure on his neck and, and drive the boat up the beach and, and like get a heli helicopter ambulance to take him to a hospital and stuff. Um, and then within weeks of that, he's back at work. A couple of years ago, uh, he got an injury in his foot that got infected and it led to him having to have his um, toe removed. And they told him because of the boat and stuff, they, and because he had to learn to balance in that again, they said, oh, you're not going to be able to work for like three months. He said to them, I will be back on the, I think, I'm not sure which day he had um, the toe removed. But uh, he said to it must have been like the middle of the week, whatever. Because I remember it was a crazy short time, like maybe five days or whatever. He said, On Monday, I will be back out on the boat working. I will do my job. I will be out there. <laughs> and sure enough, Monday comes along and where's my pop? He's out on the boat doing his job with his freshly cut off toe. <laughs> so, you know, he he just had this and, and just his work ethic was just um just whenever i saw him working it was just amazing to watch like oh my gosh <laughs> and, and then of course you know he installed that work ethic and, and stubbornness to my mother because you know my mother raised five children pretty much by herself you know she she always had to work like multiple jobs to um have uh you know money on the money for food and stuff for us and you know she would always go without herself to um, make sure we had what we needed and so for me I wanted to make sure that my kids 
because I had a good life, but I wanted them to have a different life. So I wanted to be more successful so that I could provide more easily for my children and stuff like that. And just sport was uh, kind of the way that it happened. So um, you were saying that sports was an avenue for you to to really obtain your your big dreams inside you. Um, has wrestling and jiu-jitsu always been your number one, the number one sports that you've always loved, or did you try other sports when you were younger? Uh, no. So interestingly, this is a really good lesson, actually, that small decisions change your life uh, drastically. Um, when I was younger, I tried all sorts of sport. Uh, I tried different martial arts. I tried playing rugby. I tried playing soccer. Obviously, as a blind person, those have some pretty big flaws. Like playing soccer, the people kick the ball one way and I run the other way. Like, you know, um, I tried playing cricket. I mean, imagine that. Small little balls being thrown at you that you can't even see. Absolutely terrifying. Uh, so I've, I'd always enjoyed the idea of sport. I'd always... Um, uh ended up in play fights with my brother and stuff um <laughs> and, and real fights as well basically the rule in our household was with my mom and the boys was uh if you want to fight take it outside because if you fight inside and you break something you replace it so <laughs> so, so long as we weren't using weapons if we uh got in a, dis a disagreement and we ended up in a fist fight and as long as it was kept uh, honourable, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we were basically allowed to fight with each other. It wasn't a, like, no, you guys are fighting. You're going to be in trouble for that. So, um, so, so I kind of always enjoyed physical stuff in that. And when I was 17, uh, I was living with my family. And one day my brother comes to my bedroom door and he knocks on the door and he was like, Clinton, I found a wrestling club. You should come and have a go. And he was nine and I was 17. I was like, man, go away. I, I was reading a book at the time. It was a really good book I and, and funny. I know it was a good book, but I can't remember what the book was. So, you know, what you think is good at uh, some time may not be good later. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he, keep, he keeps knocking on the door. Clinton, no, no, come. It's so cool. you got to come with me. Ah, bugger off, man. Leave me alone. You know how you are if you... Well, you know what it's like. If you have a little, like, much younger person that harassing you to do something and you're sort of doing something else and you're like, nah, go away. Anyway, he kept harassing me and eventually my mum comes up and she's like, man, Clinton, go for a walk with him and, you know, it'll shut him up and go, go have a look what he's talking about. So I was like, ah, oh, fine. And in bad grace, I got up, got, you know, got changed or whatever, and I walked down to the club and, and we walked in because I thought it was sort of WWE wrestling. And we walked in and, and I had a look and I was like, oh, that looks interesting and whatever. And the guy was like, oh, do you want to give it a go? I was like, yeah, okay, cool. So I jumped in the class and I was like, oh, man, why didn't I know this was a sport before? This is awesome. <laughs> uh, this is basically just play fighting for sport. So, um, yeah, so I, um, <laughs> so no, I did not uh, start out with wrestling and have a love uh, for wrestling and that I've always enjoyed martial arts like martial arts movies and stuff but yeah so my brother and you know that's funny right because it shows that small little decisions can change <laughs> how you go something because if, if I'd stayed at home and been like yeah no whatever and my mom hadn't been like yeah go and I decided okay I'll go with him you know I, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now right so it's so uh, like such a tiny little decision uh, change such a well, it just changed the complete traje trajectory of my life. So um, for people listening out there, you know, when when you say no to something that you think might be a small option, you know that it might be the thing that's going to completely change your life. So <laughs> be aware of that. I love that. That's a gold nugget right there. That's a gold nugget right there, Clinton. To to those that are listening, um, what I mean, wrestling is um, it's a really cool sport. What has wrestling taught you about life? Probably the biggest uh, lesson that wrestling taught me was to, like, if you're going to have a huge goal, you need to break it down into small, manageable bites. Uh, because, you know, I'd, I'd already been taught to work hard and 
you know, asset, persevering, pays off, whatever. But I'd never had like this huge giant goal before that seemed so far away and that so many people were saying, oh, you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to do it. And so I learned that, you know, if I, if I just chased the end goal and not had smaller goals to achieve along the way, it, it would have been a lot harder. So I think that's probably the biggest lesson that I learned that if you have a huge goal, like I want to be national champion or I want to be a world medalist, you've got to break that down into smaller steps and smaller goals along the way and sort of tick off the, the steps, you know, like, so yeah, that's probably the most important lesson in that aspect that wrestling gave me or, and in jujitsu, but wrestling was what I did first. Uh, that's a really great advice, Clinton, about goal setting. Um, yeah. You were mentioning earlier um, that you didn't take a point or you didn't win any of your 14 first matches in wrestling. And oh, 40, 4-0. Oh, wow, 4-0. Um, yes, 4-0, not 14. <laughs> Four, uh, 14, I would have been happy if I'd won by, the, by 14 matches. 40 was getting a bit, it was getting a bit much. Oh wow, forty so forty matches and I mean a lot of guys, a lot of women would just say like, All right, this is not for me, I'll I'll quit. Um, I can't see, like this is nothing for me. Over the course of, of this time before you won your first match, what did you say to yourself to keep yourself going? Well, there was two things. One, I genuinely enjoyed wrestling for wrestling's sake. So I enjoyed the training. I enjoyed the fact that I could do this sport. I enjoyed the sparring. I enjoyed meeting people at training. Like the club I was at um, was awesome. Like So there were a lot of bonuses other than competing. So that was uh, an advantage straight away. And, of course, the other thing was I probably could have been okay with the fact like, oh, you know, because to start with, I didn't start off wanting to be a national champion. I think – I don't know, I was like 20 matches in or something before I was like, oh, I want to be a national champion. I probably could have lost 20 matches and then been like, ah, oh, yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll just do it because I enjoy wrestling. I'm not going to be any good at competing or whatever. But then I decided that I want to, I, I've always been competitive. So winning, you know, <laughs> I always wanted to do it and I hated losing. So I was like, I want to win a match. And then I decided I wanted to be a national champion. But then people were saying to me, you can't do it. And one of the things that people know about me is that challenging me is not really, like challenging me in that way is not really a good thing because uh, I'm usually up to challenges. And so when, you know, everybody was saying, you're not going to do it. Like <laughs> there's no way you can be a national champion. I was like, J watch me do it. Like, I, I will do it to prove you wrong. Now, if it had just been the fact that I wanted to prove people wrong, I don't think I would have uh, succeeded. I think a lot of people that have interviewed me before have misunderstood this. To prove people wrong was only a, a part of my motivation. As said, I actually enjoyed wrestling for wrestling's sake. Like, I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed learning what like if I'd hated it I would have not done it right because um you have to you have to absolutely love something especially if you want to do uh something so crazy like be a national champion whenever people ask me about like what are some tips that um you could give people to achieve their goals or whatever the first thing I always say to people is number one you have to decide you actually want something <laughs> and that's not just, you know, I want it in the idea of it, but I want it, you, you don't know, like, do you truly want something by how much do you actually want it? You know how much you want something by what are you willing to sacrifice for it? Now, for me, with wrestling, I was willing to sacrifice everything that I had except my family's well-being, um, whether that was my mom, my brothers and sisters, or uh, my wife and um, and my son, because uh, when I started this journey, when I when I got to this point, uh, my son had been born, but my my daughter hadn't been born yet. So the only thing I was like, I uh, you know, at, at that point, I wasn't making any money or anything like that. I I didn't care about having lots of money, so long as 
so long as my family didn't go without, as long as I had enough money to provide for Lucian and Andrea, my wife, that was enough. If I had to go without having super nice things and stuff, that was okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I was happy to sacrifice my friends because when I was young, of course, a lot of my friends, they didn't understand my drive and or people who, you know, I thought were my friends and they wanted to go out partying every weekend and stuff like that. And they'd be like, Clinton, come out partying. And I'd be like, no, I can't. And I'd be like, oh, why not? I've got to train in the morning because I want to, you know, I want to be a national champion in wrestling. I've got to train. Sorry, I can't go out. Um, you know, I was, as I said, I was willing to sacrifice everything except my family's well-being to get to what I wanted. So that's why it's super important when people are deciding they're going to set this huge goal for themselves. Like, you know, I don't know, I want to be a world champion. I want to be a millionaire. I want to whatever, you know, ask yourself, do you really want it? And, you know, don't, don't be like, do I really want it because it sounds cool or because it's awesome or whatever, but do you really want it? Like, what are you seriously happy to sacrifice to get to where, where that goal is? So, you know, um, but yeah, the two the two things was that I loved it, and then I wanted to prove people wrong. I think that's uh, beautifully well said, Clinton. I think a lot of young people today they um, they might have big goals, or they don't know what they want to do in life. But and those that want to do big things, they they are not ready to to pay the sacrifices, and they're not willing to pay the price for it. And it seemed that you early on you knew that all right. What was the price? What is the price I need to pay? And then you're ready to pay that price every single day. Well, you you see it, and it, and again, it comes back to the whole. Well, I guess because in the a the day and age of technology, everybody's looking for the easy fix, right? Like, look at man, the gym is a perfect example of this. You watch people go to the gym and they want to get ripped, or they want to they want to get fit, or they want to get. And instead of going into the personal trainer and and you know oh you know, what sort of exercise can I do more to get fit? It's what supplements can I take to make this yeah. easy? It's really, it's really funny how people are always looking for the quick fix, the the pill, like the weight. Man, how many people become millionaires because they sell the idea of a pill? And if you take my pill, you will lose weight. Like people just want the easy fix. Like you, you're not going to become anything super big or achieve anything super meaningful with a, with an easy fix that's it's just not going to happen it's true an overnight success takes an average 10 years so i i completely agree yeah clinton when you were i mean when you started off wrestling when you set set out for this huge goal to be a national champ in in wrestling you had a japanese teacher what does yes. your japanese teacher meant to you in your life and can you tell us a story about him teaching you lessons about life and and training so my Japanese teacher, Koji Hirabashi, he came to New Zealand because he had retired uh, from work. He was a retiree, but he had wrestled himself. He'd actually retired from wrestling. He had gone and worked for the Shell Company, um, and he'd made a reasonable amount of money. So he'd come to New Zealand to retire because, um, you know, New Zealand's a beautiful country, and he loved it here. And he loves New Zealand beer. He, he, he loves his beer, Mr. Koji, so that's cool. And so he was, uh, you know, coming to have the enjoyment part of his life, right? And um, wrestling was always something that he had enjoyed doing and he had always thought about coaching. Uh, so he had represented Canada, actually, in the Olympic Games in uh, 1964. And then he came to New Zealand and um, he, I'm not quite sure how he ended up at our club, but he came and did a seminar for us. And he watched me training and everything. And he had terrible English, so it wasn't exactly like this conversation. But um, at the end of the training session, he came and said to me, oh, I've never seen a blind person wrestle before. Like, how long have you been wrestling and stuff? And he talked to me and whatever. I said, his English is really bad. So it was quite a difficult conversation. But he, um, he said, oh, what are your goals through wrestling? And I said to him, oh, I want to be a national champ. And by this time, I'd also decided that I wanted to – um because i'd scored some points in that by this time and i'd won the occasional match but not very much i'd never won a medal i decided that not only did i want to be a national champ but i either wanted to go to the commonwealth games the world championships or the olympic games for wrestling i didn't care which one of those three but i just wanted to go to one of those three um so he was like oh okay 
uh, well, we've got a lot of work to do. We should get on with that. And I was like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, well, you know, you've got these big goals um, because he'd, he'd um, applied for a job or volunteered his time to become an instructor at my gym. And he was like, well, that's a cool, uh, cool goal. And, you know, I'd like to see you have it, uh, to achieve it. I'd like to help you with that. I'll tell you what, I'll trade you extra wrestling lessons if you help me with speaking English. So I'd come to training through the class and then I'd stay for half an hour after class and work with him one-on-one. And then I would go, I would travel right across um, Auckland City like an hour and a half by public transport to go to the gym that I wanted to train at. So I'd take the train right from the west side of Auckland City to the south side of Auckland. And then after um, training, he would take me back to the city, which was like the middle point. So when I would take the train, I'd take the train from the west of Auckland to the city and then from the city out to the south of Auckland to um, train. And he didn't want me to, because uh, if I did that on the way home, I wouldn't make my second train. So he would drive me from the gym to the city for me to take my second train. And while he did that, we would talk English and he'd get me to correct him and help him with spoken English and things like that. So we uh, we worked together uh, for about uh, two years. And then finally in 2007, he cornered me to my first national title, which was an amazing feeling because, you know, I'd been telling everybody for um, nearly eight years because it's the end of 2007. I've been telling everybody for eight years it's going to happen. And finally, this guy came along and he believed in me and he helped me out. And finally, I'm a national champion and I could tell everybody, um, you know, look, I, I did it. I, you know, I achieved it. And then, you know, he helped me make the national team and, and we ended up winning a lot of international medals in wrestling before I retired and stuff. And I think the most important thing that Koji taught me uh, are sort of life lessons. And again, when people ask me to give um, tips uh, about the five things or, or like give tips about what you'd use for success. The first thing, as I said, I tell people is that you have to know you absolutely want your, uh, your to achieve your goal and what are you willing to sacrifice for it. The second thing that I tell people is you need to believe that you can achieve the goal because if you don't believe in you, then you're not going to make it. So you have to believe in yourself. Um, no matter what people tell you, um, you know, whether people tell you you're not going to make it, you just got to be like, yeah, right, I'm going to make it. You have to have belief in yourself. And then the third thing I tell people, and this is where um, where Koji comes in, is that although you have to believe in yourself, sometimes when it gets really tough, no matter how much self-belief you have, unfortunately, humans have this horrible dark voice inside that like to creep in and go, maybe you can't do it, <laughs> you know, and, and it likes to try and undermine you. So what you need is one person and you only need one person. But you and, and I was lucky enough to have two. Um, but you need one person that believes that you can achieve what you're aiming for. And that person's job is to keep you on the straight and narrow. And it's not always to be like, yeah, I believe in you. Yeah, you're going to make it and be positive affirmation and stuff like that. Sometimes that person that believes in you, their job is to kick your ass. Like, you know, um, I've got a headache today. Oh, I've got a headache. I'm not going to come into training. And then coach will send me a message. Why aren't you at training? Oh, you know, I've got a headache and I couldn't come in. I thought you wanted to be a national champion. National champions don't have days off just because they got a headache. Um, that That's not actually something that happened. It's just like an example that I can use. Um, <laughs> um, you know, like their job sometimes is to be like, no, you can't be lazy. You told me you want to be a national champion. Like, you know, maybe maybe somebody has a birthday party you really want to go to the birthday party and they're like wait on a minute i thought you told me you want to be a national champion you should find a way around that you've got to train before going to the birthday party or something you know like and and so the one person that's there to believe in you yeah they believe in you so they can um you know they can celebrate all the good times and that with you because they you know that like, yeah we we achieved another step in the goal you know you're another step closer we, we are going to get there but sometimes they're there to kick your ass and keep you on the straight and narrow. Clinton, why did he choose you why did he say all right i'm going to train you i'm going to coach you i'm going to make you the national champ um and i mean it's super impressive 
um, by just looking at your resume, you know. Um, I mean, you can't trust everything that, that you can read on the internet, but 10 times national champ in wrestling, if I'm correct, you know. Yes, um, and five-time five national champion in jiu-jitsu. <laughs> you see, uh, it's super impressive um, fighting against sighted um, athletes. How did he choose you? I think because, you know, as he said, when he came into the training session, he saw that it, he was like, oh, I've never seen a blind person wrestle before. That's kind of cool. And then he, you know, when I told him I want to be a national champ, I think he was like, wow, this blind guy wants to do something um, super awesome. I, I want to help him. Um, I want to help him achieve that. And, and I want to be a part of that. To be honest, it never really came up. Like I, I don't actually know his reasons why he decided because he helped everybody else. Like it wasn't like I was the only person that he helped, and you know there were a lot of people who Koji encouraged and he helped out and stuff. We were always close, and he always was just so encar- like I don't know more encouraging to me. And I, I think it's just because he did see other people saying, you know, he's not going to make it. What what he what he wants to do is impossible and and i don't know i i guess he saw something in me my stubbornness on the mat the, the fact that i always gave everything 100 percent, and and he was like man this is a this is something cool that i want to get behind and, and let's see if we can do it i don't know whether when he started coaching me he truly believed it would be able to happen or not um but you know a, as a coach who said okay let's get on with it and do do the job his job was to make me believe that he believed it and, and you know I, I did you know i i believe that he believed in me and and he definitely put in a lot of extra work to help me get there and and you know i'm so lucky that i met him what lessons did you did you learn from your japanese teacher about coaching that you're passing on now and are applying with your own students i think the thing that i learned from koji about um coaching is that you know if you have a belief in someone anybody can achieve their goal now i would never have anyone come into my gym and say to me you know you like uh, like tell me that they have a huge goal but even if i thought okay you may not do that or that's an extremely unlikely thing to have happen I would never say that to anyone. I would do my best to help them achieve whatever they want because as a coach, I see myself as a facilitator. Um, if someone comes, it's my job to give people or to help them achieve whatever their goal is when they walk in into training with me. And, and I treat people differently um, depending on what their goal is. Um, if someone comes in and says to me, I've had this happen a couple of times. Um, a couple of people come in, they're over the age of 40. Um, they come in, they say, look, Clinton, I want to come in. I want to do jujitsu because I want to learn a bit of self-defense. And I want a fun way to keep fit and, you know, keep myself in shape. And it, it's going to be fun. But, but while I'm doing that, I'm going to learn some self-defense in that. My job is to give that to them. My job is to make sure their experience is fun uh, and to teach them some skills. So what don't you do to that guy? You don't partner him up with someone who is getting ready for the national champs or for an international tournament who's going super hard and is trying to thrash everybody on the mat and whatever, because that's not the experience that person is looking for. You partner them up with people, their own skill level or people that are going to go to the right intensity to make it the experience they are looking for. Um, And then you get young kids that come in and say, um, you know, I want to be world champion. Well, the way I'm going to treat you and what I'm going to expect from, like if that 40 year old rings me up one day and goes, oh, uh, Clinton, you know, I'm just a bit tired today. It was a really hard day at work. I'm not going to make it in. Um, I'll see you next training. I'll be like, oh, sweet. All good. Make sure you have a good rest, have a good meal. And I'll see you next training. No problem. You know, like I understand what they're at training for. If a young kid who says to me, Clinton, I want to be world champion. And they don't turn up to training. And I'm like, why didn't you turn up? And they're like, oh, I had a hard day at school and I was tired. I'm like, don't give me that crap. (laughs) I don't care how tired you are. You turn up to training after school because you told me you want to be a world champion, Uh, you know, be at training. So I think 
the way Koji dealt with people and, and stuff is that I believe that, you know, it's my job to help people um, achieve their goals and to give them someone who believes in their goals. Like even, even if I think it's going to be a super tough goal, um, it's my job to believe that, yeah, they, if, if they really want it, they can find a way and it's my job to facilitate and give my best effort to help them uh, achieve whatever uh, their goal is that they're setting for themselves. Do you think that could be applied, Clinton, to, to any work, not only in the sports world, but like for people that work in offices or, or anything like that? I believe it could be, depending on um, uh, depending on the situation. Um, but in, in some form, uh, I guess that is uh, applicable, but I guess it's in different ways, right? I think when you come up to being like a team leader, for example, in an office, um, uh, things would apply. Like if you have um, somebody under you who has goals and stuff, then it's your job to facilitate them um, rising and trying to help them get better and climb the ladder, I guess. And and if you've got someone who, you know, is there and, and they're there to just work and put enough money on the on the table and um, uh, put enough money, uh, put enough money to feed their family and stuff, but they're not interested in advancing their career and that because uh, like, you know, family, you know, some people are happy enough to earn money to support their family, but their family means more. Their family is more important. So I, I think then, you know, you've got to kind of, work things around and help them like you know not push them to climb the ladder and um you know ask like make sure you're communicating with them about your their family like do your family have um everything they need and whatever because if they think or if you have the same concerns they do like if your thought is the well-being of their family they are probably gonna put more output for you because you're working towards the same goal they are so i think if if people worked or understood what people's goals were and, and their methods and worked with them to achieve their goals, you can, I don't know, have more loyalty in, in customers. Like if, if you have someone who comes to your works for you and they say, look, you know, I'm here basically to earn enough money to uh, put food on my uh, family's table and everything. Um, but I don't care about going up the ladder too high or whatever. And and then you're you're like the head of the company or whatever, and and all you care about is I want high output from you, and and um, you know, but yet you never ask them like how are your family doing today, you know, like get to know their obviously their family super important, so uh, find out what their kids' names are, find out what their um, you know their husband wife's name is, like get like understand their personal life because if you take that sort of interest they're naturally going to put in more work and stuff for you because they understand that you care what their aims and their goals are as well, not just your own. But, but I mean, that's like, that's just something theory that I'm coming up with right now because I'm not a super big office person or anything. <laughs> you, you would probably know more about stuff like that than I would. Yeah. But I mean, I was curious to hear your answer, you know, it's completely, completely transferable. You know what you were saying about coaching, uh, coaching, um, different athletes, different students in different ways. It's completely 100% applicable to, to management of, of people in, in offices. And I think there are some really great lessons there for, for the people that are listening that you can't treat everyone the same because everyone has different goals, different motivations. And um, I think your goal as a leader, your goal as a manager, your goal as a coach is really to discover that, like you were saying. Your goal is to discover what are what people are really driven by, and then try to facilitate it. You know. Well, here, here's a, another one. This one might be more applicable for um, offices and that as well. Is that people react differently to different um, stimulus or the way you treat them? For example, in uh, I, I've got two people. Or like I coach holy people, but um, I've got two people in mind. When I'm cornering these two people they react completely differently. One of them, if they're competing and I don't know, they're dropping points and they're not doing very well and they come back to me and I'm like, you know, what did you do that for? You know better than that. Like, you know, why, 
you know, and really give them a hard time and, and be like, you know, you're doing bad and you know better. You should be doing better because, you know, you know better than that and really lay it on them. They'll go out and they'll perform better for me. Now, if I do that exact same thing to this other person, they'll shut down. And when they go back out, they won't listen to me from the corner and they won't listen to my advice or whatever. And if I'm super loud and aggressive from the corner, they won't listen. They'll shut down. Um, so when they come back to the corner and if, if things are going well, uh, not going so well, you know, you've got to be like, look, you know, things are, you know, they're not going quite the way we wanted to. You're doing this, this, and this really, really well, but I need you to change this for me because if you don't, we're not going to get the, the outcome we're looking for. So yes, you are doing these things really well, but I need you to change this aspect of what's going on in the match so that we can have the outcome we want. And I've got to keep super calm and like, uh, you know, and, and like nice calm voice and quiet for them and stuff like that. And then they'll go out there and, and, you know, and, and I'll be like, you know, when they're fighting, like, what, what, where's the change? Come on. You know, we, we agreed we were going to change this. Where is the change that we're looking for? You know? And so the different methods of communicating with people are super important. So in the office, that would be exactly the same. Like if you, you know, there, there's one person that if you just like, if they do something wrong and you, and you're like, Oh, you know, you, you did this wrong, but you, you know, mostly I, you did this sort of stuff good, but I'd like you to change just this. They all they hear is, Oh, I did this good. <laughs> that, that's all that matters. Uh, that person might need you to be like, hey, you did this wrong and you need to fix it because if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And then you have someone else in the office and if you do that to them, they, all they hear is the negative and it's like, oh, oh no, I, I did something wrong. And, and then they shut down and they, they don't hear the constructive criticism either. So I think learning um, different methods of communicating and then being able to read your person and tailoring your methods of communication to specific people rather than having a, this is the way I communicate and that's the way I'm going to do it with everybody because not everybody's the same and not everybody's going to react the same. So I yes. think that would probably be more applicable to office situations than. Completely agree on that. Everybody what has travel like taught you, Clinton? Um, just that, uh, you know, people, that there's so many, um, <laughs> there's so many different beliefs and ways of doing things and languages mm. and, and just that, that people do things in different ways and and there's just so much to learn i think the, the thing that travel teaches me is that um well two things one is that our world is so huge it's crazy like our world is actually massive and two that i actually really appreciate the country that i'm in because you know like india man although there, you know there are some things i like about india and like, I, I don't want to insult anybody who might watch or listen, but coming from New Zealand to India was such a shock to me, like, just of the pollution and the traffic and the crowding of people. And, like, when I was 22 and, and I was wrestling and stuff, I didn't really have a – like, I knew what I wanted to achieve, but I didn't really have, like, a set way of doing things. Uh, like, like, I didn't – Sorry, I didn't have a methodical approach to achieving what I wanted to achieve. Um, so I would tell myself to set up methods to um, and and have a plan to get to where I want to to where I want to go and what that plan is going to look like. And and even down to the smaller details, like if I, uh, for example, uh, when I started jujitsu, of course my wrestling was very good, and so being on top of people was all good and whatever. But uh, in wrestling, if you pin someone's shoulders in the mat, that's it; it's game over. But in jujitsu, you know, how, most of the game you can either play it from the top or the bottom. The person can play from the bottom position. And when I came there, I didn't even like I being on my back was just such a foreign concept to me. And after six weeks. Um, so on the belt, you have a colored belt and then you get four stripes on the belt and then you move up to the next color. So after just six weeks of training, my coach gives me the first two stripes of my white belt. And he says to me, okay, Clinton, now every time I look at you, whenever you're training now, I want to see you learning how to fight off your back. And when I give you your blue belt, um, you'll know you've done enough work in this area. 
And I was like, oh, okay. So I went from being able to handle myself against white and blue belts to getting absolutely smashed. I was like, okay, I need a, a process of how to get better at this quickly. Cause I don't, you know, I, but by then I was a national champion athlete. I didn't want to get beaten up at training. That was embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> so so um, I was like, okay, first, because there are many different types of guards in jujitsu. So I was like, okay, first of all, I'm going to pick a guard that I like the look of that I think can work for me and that I want to get good at. So um, I picked a guard called close guard. So I said to myself, okay, for the next two weeks, if I, if I just, get my to this position close guard no matter what else happens then that's it i've achieved my goal for training for tonight and then i picked an attack from that position that i wanted to master and i was like okay for the next two weeks of training if all i do is close my guard and get this one attack no matter what else happens or how badly things go wrong the rest of the match you know i will have achieved what i wanted to do and so i slowly built up my bottom game in in that um manner of choosing a specific thing to work on um to better myself so you know plan not just the big thing but like have um like a plan of how you're going to get there because <laughs> uh, without a plan it does make things a bit more difficult so that's probably the main thing i tell myself okay uh and what's the best or most worthwhile investment you have made it could be in money time or energy Oh, best with, well, just my training because my training, my grappling has given me everything. Like, um, it's given me all my experiences and stuff. And now also it's my job. So it's the way I make money. And eventually, uh, when I open my gym, uh, my plan is that it'll make me quite a bit more money. So, you know, just, um, probably my biggest investment would be my training and that's both in time and money because it, it's cost a fair bit to learn my skills as well. Of course. And I mean, all, uh, I'm sure a lot of the, a lot of people in the audience, but also myself, you know, sometimes we feel afraid to do something. Um, what do you do when you feel afraid? I just do it because, um, you know, there's a really, I don't know who said it, but there's a really good saying that, you know, heroes are not people that are not afraid. Heroes are people that when they see or they are afraid, they do it anyway. And I've never wanted to let my blindness, um, stop me doing things so i've done so many crazy my rule before i had my children because when i had my kids it was slightly different my rule was i would do anything so long as it didn't risk the life the lives of other people so i rode motorbikes but like when i rode a motorbike i would go to like a river or whatever where we knew like with my brothers and and we knew there were not other people on the road I, i've driven a car same thing we went down to a river track or a dirt road where we knew there weren't people for miles and miles and and i drove a car um i've jumped off extremely high places into water i you know I, i've done heaps of crazy stuff because i guess the advice i would give people is if you're afraid and you don't do something then you're not really living like you man if you're afraid of doing something and, and you but you want to do it and then you don't do it. You're not living your life. If you just, if, if we truly thought about life, we wouldn't do anything. Like seriously, walking outside your house, you should be afraid of doing that, right? Like it's dangerous. You should get hit by a car. You right. Should, I don't know, anything could go wrong when you walk out your door. So I don't know. You walk out your door anyway, right? And you're not afraid. So if you can sort of, uh, you know, bring that attitude to things where you are afraid. I'm afraid of doing it. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm not afraid, whatever, whatever. I'm the first person to tell people I'm very nervous when I compete. I throw up 80% of the time before I compete. So on 80% of competition mornings, because of my nerves, I will go and throw up. <laughs> and, you know, I still go and compete. <laughs> um... Clinton, you have big plans to open up a, a gym. Do you already have a location, a, a name of the gym in mind, or is this a long-term goal? Uh, well, it was a 
it was a medium term goal at towards the end of last year. So a friend of mine and myself want to open it. Uh, and we had decided we were actually going to open it at the start of um, 2021. Uh, we would do it then. So we were just sort of um, in the beginning of planning stages like uh, we've sort of got a va- like an outline of the area we want to open. Obviously, we don't have an exact location because it's still too far out from that yet. Um, but, you know, we were setting up the names and um, I was getting my wife to, uh, draw up like logos and we were like like you know agreeing like the way we want to run the gym and the and the targeted audience of the people we wanted at the gym and stuff and then coronavirus hit and we have a thing called social distancing now so we kind of have to wait and see how this is all going to play out my my strength is definitely not in money my friend um, is uh, uh, my, uh, I mean, he's also a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and very good. He's actually my main corner person when I compete. Um, but when we go into business, I'll probably be the head of coaching, arranging all the coaching, setting up like um, uh, the syllabuses and all of that sort of stuff. And he'll be more in charge of, you know, how the gym works, making sure our taxes are paid and all of that stuff because that that is definitely not my strength area so um we we had sort of done a reasonable amount of pre-planning and stuff like that but as said now we're going to have to wait and see partly because we're not sure what's going to happen to our economy in new zealand and how much money and stuff people are going to have and you know when are people going to feel safe to go back to that sort of environment and things like that? Because at the moment, we're just coming into level two here in New Zealand where we are allowed to train in like a group of 10 or whatever. But at the moment, you know, I, I like all gyms that I know, the, the one thing they are saying is we're, we're not going to accept new members at this time, you know, because we want to know and trust the people that we have coming in and training and things like that. So uh, we are going to have to have a bit of time of waiting and seeing. But that's okay because... You know, I've got time to make this goal happen. So, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to see, I'm competitive. So when I open a gym, I'm going to want it to be a very good gym. So I don't want to rush in and go, hey, you know what? Coronavirus happened, whatever. It doesn't matter. Let's just open up the gym and just see what happens. Because to me, that doesn't make sense. I completely understand that. Sure. Um, but you'll please keep us updated about that, Clinton. So the people are listening from New Zealand can go and check out your gym uh, the day you're launching. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. Where can people find, find you online to learn more about you? Where can they go to say hello to your social media or if there are any companies there that, that might be interested to, to sponsor you and, and your jiu-jitsu journey? Uh, so the best place is my Instagram account, which is at blind grappler or one word. Uh, that's where I do most of my social media these days. I do have a Facebook page under the same name, uh, blind grappler and, uh, my, my personal Facebook page is Clinton Terry, uh, on Facebook at the moment, my personal Facebook page is a bit of, it's a bit weird because I don't know something happened with coronavirus and I've been getting like literally hundreds of friend requests and i'm kind of like well you know my personal first i don't actually post i don't actually like social like if i didn't have to do social media i probably wouldn't do it um people it's funny because a long time people didn't really see photos of my wife and stuff on my social media partly because she doesn't like photos of her being taken and stuff but all of my social media is um jujitsu related Okay. Uh, I never really post up personal stuff. Like, you know, I, I don't really let people know what's going on within my family, for example, because I don't know, those people that post up every argument they have in their family on social media, I, I don't understand that. So whenever all these people are like asking to be friends on my personal page, I'm like, man, why don't you just go follow my athlete page and, <laughs> and whatever. But that, for some reason they've been, and, and it's annoying, right? Because you get, I try to, if, if I know they're jujitsu people or whatever, and I try to, you know, friend them, whatever, but then you end up with a lot of these spam people and then the next thing you're getting email or like just messages and stuff, which uh, it's been really annoying. So 
the as it, the best places to reach me is Instagram. All right, so uh, it's, because that, because that way you can just follow my page and then you can uh, DM me, right? I uh, I try my my rule. I, I mean, I, when I say I don't do social media, it's it's because of the whole I don't agree with sharing all my personal stuff, right? But if people reach out to me on social media, my rule is I try to respond to everybody. So if if anybody leaves a comment on a post, I will try unless you just leave emojis, in, in which case I think you're um, lazy, so I won't respond to you. I'll probably like your comment, but I won't put a comment back. But if you put a um, a comment or whatever, I'm going to respond. If you DM me, I'm going to respond because, you know, I, I believe that, uh, you know, people want to reach out to me and if, if they make that effort, then, you know, the least they deserve is a response. I'm not saying I'm going to have like hours long conversations with everybody that messages me, but you will get some sort of response and, and depending on where you go with that, depending on how much more interaction we'll have, I guess. So long as you're not being stupid. I've had, man, I had this one guy real, I don't know. I'm guessing he was trolling because surely he couldn't be that ignorant, but he sends me a message and he was like, so Clinton, serious question. With being blind, how do you wipe your own bum? <laughs> and I, I sent him back a message. I'm like, man, you must be shitting me, right? Like, do you use a mirror when you're wiping your own? I was like, bugger off. So, you know, if you send me stupid stuff like that, I'm probably just going to delete your message. But if it's, if it's sensible stuff, then uh, I'm going to get back to you. Yeah, I mean, social media can be a dark place. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> most of the time, I don't have that. Like, um, you know, most of the stuff I get is pretty cool. Like, I, I get a lot of uh, coaches reaching out to me that have blind people that might be interested in joining or people that, you know, like, oh, I've had a friend who did jujitsu and, and he's losing his eyesight. We don't, you know, we don't want him to give up. Can you send him words of um, encouragement or whatever? That's mostly what I get. And I, I like that sort of stuff, you know. I, I haven't had too much hating. Like I, I post up matches. Like if you go on my Instagram page, you can see uh, matches of me fighting. And I post matches of both me winning and me losing because like a lot of athletes don't do that. Like they don't post up the matches where they lose or whatever. But man, as I said, I'm just Clinton. So being Clinton, sometimes I lose matches. It just is what it is. And I'm okay with that. Like, I'm not embarrassed by that. And I'm not ashamed of it. So, uh, you know, I I quite often post up matches where someone beats me and gives them credit. Like, man, this person gave me a really awesome match and they beat me. It wasn't my day and I learned a lot from it. Thank you for the match. Like, great. I'm okay with that. So, yes. Awesome. Well, it's been great to have you on the show, Clinton. I really, uh, really appreciate your valuable time. And I'm sure uh, our audience has appreciated your super inspired, inspirational story and I've learned a lot from it. Uh, have a great evening. Take care of yourself and I hope to keep in touch with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Fika with Rice. I hope you enjoyed the show. Who do you want to have on our show? Let us know by sending me an email at frederick at absoluteinternship.com. And before you go, if you like this conversation, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes or Spotify to get to listen to more inspirational stories and life hacks. We'd really appreciate it.